Good morning, and I'd like to welcome you here. Good morning. Beautiful Sabbath morning. <coughs> so I have to let him get everything in the back. Ready. Um, we looked at this last week. We looked at what took place right before they came to the shore. And that was they were crossing the lake, and that night a storm came up, and Jesus calmed the wind and the waves. As soon as that was over with, they rowed to the shore. And after seeing Jesus calm the wind and the waves, and they asked themselves, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They get out on the shore, and from the tombs come two men, filled with demons, rushing at them. Now again, I told you that the disciples witnessed Jesus had power over nature. But yet, they get out of the boat, these guys come rushing at them, and the disciples run the different direction. Okay? <coughs> Desire our um, yeah, Desire of Ages, I told you last week, speaks of this. And she says that Jesus stood there, the disciples ran away, thought he was running with them. They turned, expecting him to be with them, and he was back at the boat. He was just waiting. Not afraid, not anxious, but waiting. I want you to think about and picture in your mind what took place in this story. Because I want you to see the kind of power that Jesus Christ has. Jesus gets out of the boat. This man who the Bible and Gary read it from Mark, <coughs> the story is also in Matthew, the story is also in Luke, tells you that this man had no clothes on, that they tried to chain him and bind him and hold him and he would break the chains. And so he had broken fetters and chains on him as well. And I would tell you that at nighttime, he would scream and make noise and sound like an animal. So, do you think this guy was scary? Yeah. If he came rushing at you, now again, uh, I believe it's Matthew tells you that there was two of them. And again, the spirit of prophecy and the desire of ages says that there was two of them who came rushing. Do you think you would run away? i got to tell you that I would run away. And I don't know if I would go back and tame it. But you got to love Jesus because, again, Jesus had power over demons. Right? But what I want you to understand is that these demons knew who he was. Who are demons? And who is the devil? What were they before they became the devil and demons? Turn with me to, it's going to be Ezekiel. Look there first. Let me get this right ahead. Turn with me to Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in what? Are you sure you're there? Now, that wasn't rhetorical. No. Is that the right text? No. Yeah. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. What does 12 say? Okay, so hold on for a minute. It's Let's later see. on that it says that. Yeah, it does. It does. Now listen, what I'm reading is I'm reading directly out of Patriarchs and Prophets. Oh, okay. And it tells you to go to there. But you're right. So thank you. Shows me that you're paying attention when you're there. <laughs> we'll start at 12. Gives you the context. Now listen, Ezekiel is writing to the king of Tyre. But let me ask you a question. When you start reading this, is he really talking about the king of Tyre? Was the king of Tyre in the beginning in the Garden of Eden? No. no. Was the king of Tyre made perfect no. in beauty and wisdom? No. So you understand when you're reading this, this is actually speaking of somebody else. I want you to understand who it's being spoken of. Okay, so... You seal up the sun full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You get that? Are you there? Yeah. Okay, verse 13. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. 
I don't want to go through all of these stones. The workmanship of your tablets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. What does that mean? What's the tablets and pipes? Voice. You understand his vocal voice. This man or this this being could sing and could sing beautiful. More beautiful than any person on this earth after the fall could ever sing. Who is it talking about here? Lucifer. Lucifer, son of the morning. This was Satan before he fell. When God created him, God created him perfect. There was no darkness, nor sin, nor evil in him. He was perfect. He was the covering cherub, the covering angel. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You are on the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the middle of the stones of fire. You were, what's that word? Perfect. Perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created till when? Iniquity. What's that word iniquity mean? Sin. Until sin was found in you. This is why it's called the mystery of iniquity. God didn't create it. It was never part of God's plan. But I want you to understand this. God made angels just like He made you. He gave them the freedom to choose. Right? He gave them the freedom to choose to serve Him or not to serve Him. Now when He created Lucifer and all the other angels, they chose to serve Him. Why? Because God is love. Now think about this. They stood in the very presence of God. They could see Him. They could hear Him. Jesus Christ, they could touch. But were they equal with God? No. Because if they were equal with God, then they themselves would be God. They were the creature. God was the creator. And God made them, and God is love, and they knew that love. And so for, the Bible doesn't tell you, for a period of time there was harmony and peace in all of heaven, in all of God's creation. And Lucifer was the light bearer. He was the messenger of God. And God used him in an exalted and mighty way more than any other angel. And it says that he was made perfect <coughs> until iniquity was what? Found in him. Meaning that something in him changed. What was it that changed in him? His heart. His heart. His character. His character. Very well said. Listen. Lucifer was created just like Adam and Eve was created. They were selfless. They were created to love others, and their focus was others-centered. Is that right, Ricky? Angels, others-centered. Do you know what the definition of the word angel means? Messenger, messenger right? A messenger. They were God's messengers. Their purpose for being was to serve others. Right? Not to exalt themselves, but to be a messenger and to serve others for God. God would give them a message. They would take that message and spread it out to all of God's creation. Right? That was their purpose. Satan was the head. He was in charge of that. So listen, it tells you that iniquity was found in him. Something happened and something took place. It says, little by little, little by little, Lucifer came to indulge desire for self-exaltation. The scripture says that thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Turn to Ezekiel 28, verse 
17. It says again, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. Therefore I will cast you to the ground and I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. So what caused this change in Lucifer? Pride. Pride. Self-exaltation. He looked at himself and he became proud. And he thought to himself, I'm better than this. I can be so much more than what God has made me to be. Now I've told you all this before. Angels were created, and the day they were created, whatever they were created for, that's what they were going to be all eternity. And that's how God made them, and they should have been, and, they, and for, for a long period of time, they were happy with that. Ricky? Lucifer knew that he, in his own mind, he could do it without God. That was his problem. He could do it without God. And it, which is our problem. Yes. Very well said. God created them to be servants. Amen. To serve, not to be served. Hence the problem. Amen. He made them to be others centered. And they didn't have a problem with that. When they were around God, and God is others centered as well, and God is love, then their whole purpose of being was to show and to share love. Love is never proud. Love is never boastful. Love is never puffed up. Isn't that what 1 Corinthians 13 says? Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. This is the description of love. This is the description of agape love. Ricky, when you have that, can you read it for me? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sound of brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long in its time. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Stop. I want you to see the contrast here between what Lucifer had and who he was when he had pure holy love inside of him and what he became start with love never and then go from there yeah back up and, and though I bestow all my goods to keep going from there and though I get my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Keep love going. suffers long. Stop. Right? Love suffers long. That's what God does. What Satan did is pervert that love to tell you that love is impatient. I love you as long as you love me, but I may grow tired of you, and so then I'll love somebody else. Isn't that the world? Amen. That's the kind of love Satan had to offer. Going. Love does not parade itself. It's not Stop. Up. What does it mean that love does not parade itself? That's a that's a King James version word. Brag boasts. It lifts itself up above others. It draws the attention to me. You understand? That's what Satan has to offer. That's the kind of love Satan has, and that's the kind of love the world has to offer. Just look at any celebrity. So look at TV. That's the kind of love the world looks for. A love that is puffed up, that draws attention to itself. But that's not the kind of love that God has. God's love is other-centered. God's love looks out for your betterment above mine. Ricky? 
It does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. Stop. Was there ever any rudeness in heaven before Lucifer no. fell? Think about that. Okay? Love is never rude. What, what does that actually mean? How can love be rude? Amen. Have you met rude people? Yes. You love them at that moment? But, so what I want you to understand is I want you to see the contrast here between the character of God and the character of Satan. <coughs> because these are the character traits of each one. Amen. God is never rude and God's love is never rude. And when we are able to understand and are converted into that kind of agape love, our love will be the same way. It's not puffed up. It's never rude. It looks out for the betterment of others more than ourselves. Keep going, Ricky. Do not provoke. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. fail. Whether there are tongues, they will fail. cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Mm. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. <coughs> and now abide faith, hope, love. love. What's the greatest of them? Love. love. Okay? So listen, that's what Lucifer fell from. Now, the Bible tells you that he can appear as an angel of what? We go back to our story about this man who had not just one devil or twelve devils, but he had a legion of devils inside of him. What do you think they looked like if you could see them? Can you imagine how far they fell? They were angels that could stand in the very presence of God. They had light that enshrouded them. And because of their separation from God and their turning their back on truth and love and righteousness, that's what they turned into. This is why God does not play around with sin. Because this is what sin causes. Understand that there is no such thing as a little sin. There is no such thing as a white lie. Yes, sir. I was just wondering about uh, the angels were beautiful in heaven and uh, glorious, and, but when they when the fallen angels fell, did that change their appearance? The Bible tells you that again that Satan and his ministers are able to appear as angels of light, so they can still show themselves in that form. But what you see from these demons that are inside this man, it just goes to show you the power that they have. So in reality, they're very ugly. Is that what you're saying? Or... What do you guys think? No. Yeah. I think sin has decayed them. I believe that sin has decayed them, but I believe they still have the power to make themselves yes. appear but it's a trick. It's a deception. It's not real. Now let me ask you a question. You guys that are older and have been seasoned with life, have you met people who you were friends with when they were young and they were kind, friendly people, but life has turned them bitter and cranky? Did it change their appearance? Did it change their character? So think about what what life can do to us. Now think about those people that you know who have led a life of sin, who have walked away from God. Uh, think about this. Think about some of the, the
the, the most popular people when you were in high school? The ones that got all the dates, okay? Uh, and then you see them now at your age, and, and they have lived a life of sin. And you see how that has changed them. So think of what it would be like for one of these fallen angels. I believe that, yes, this has changed them. But they still have the power to deceive and to appear. That's all it is, is an appearance. And show themselves as angels of light. Now turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14, and let's look at verses 13 and 14. Tom, do you have that? Can you read it for me? Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into your heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farther side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Who's that being spoken of here? This is Lucifer. This was the desire of his heart. This is what made that change from Lucifer, the light bearer, to Satan, the fallen angel. What did he want? He wanted to be like God. Now let me ask you, in the Godhead, how many is there? And who are they? Did Lucifer want to take the Father's place? No. Say that loud, because I got both answers. No. Who's the great controversy with? Christ and Satan. Lucifer wanted to take Christ's place. He wanted to set his throne and sit on Christ's throne. Is Jesus God? Yes. Okay? So again, I would tell you, if you have the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, go home this afternoon and read chapter 1. And it will give you a great explanation of how we got into this mess and how a light bearer, Lucifer, turned into Satan the devil. And what it was, is he looked at Christ and he saw Christ's exalted position. And he said, I should not have to bow down to him. I am equal with him. And that wasn't enough for him. He said, I should be above him. What you find is that Lucifer coveted Christ's position. And he went to the other angels and he said, I should not have to bow down to Christ. But I should be equal with Christ. We should be equal with Christ. Have you ever thought, how could you get these beings that are superior in strength, superior in wisdom, and make them fall? They stood in the very presence of God. How'd that happen? Is Lucifer smart? Yeah. Is he smarter than me and you? Yes. Sometimes I look at him and think, dude, you're dumb. <laughs> How could he think that he could actually overcome God? Right. But listen, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of detail into this. And there's a reason for that. But the spirit of prophecy gives us more and expands on what the Bible says. Okay? And I want to give you a little insight into that this morning. Again, we read Isaiah, what Lucifer's ambition was. It says, though all his glory was from God, this mighty angel came to regard it as pertaining to himself. What he did is the power and the glory that he got from God who created him. He said, I did this. I made myself this way. Understand? And he exalted himself. And when he did that, it perverted his thoughts. 
and it made him going from a selfless being to a selfish. Selfish. Let me ask you a question. Was Lucifer deceived? The answer is yes. And he was self-deceived. Because he was self-deceived, does that, does that relinquish him from the uh, accountability for what he did? No. Right? How many of us are self-deceived on a daily basis? Okay? And will it relinquish you from the accountability of your actions? <coughs> this, again, is the deception and the darkness of sin. And this is why you should not play with it. Why you should not entertain thoughts or actions or allow yourself to be tempted. Now listen, you guys know, and I know, from example, temptation happens in stages. If you're tempted, you think. You think you're tempted. But there's points in time there where you have the opportunity to go to God and ask Him, please save me, strengthen me, help me to turn away from this. Amen. But at some point, you continue to choose to walk towards and entertain those thoughts of temptation until that temptation comes to life and then it bears its fruit and the harvest is what? Death. Okay? Satan had the same opportunity. So did Eve. So did Eve. They felt the same way. It says, Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in all the affections and allegiances of all the created beings, it was Satan's endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to himself. The coveting, or, and coveting the glory with which the infinite God had invested his son, the prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. So it goes on to tell you that there came a day when God called all the angels together. Did this take God by surprise? Think about it. Did it take God by surprise? No. Is God able to read your mind? Yes. Does God know your thoughts? Yes. Does He not know the thoughts of the angels as well? Yes. Why does it not say that God just took Him to the side, shook Him a little bit, with that godly power, and put the fear of God in Him? And that can only be done through conscious choice. By making a decision, by God showing him, and Lucifer seeing the truth, and making a decision. So God allowed time to take place between when Lucifer was thinking these things, and how this would play out. Okay? So, you're told that again, a day came when God needed to actually step in. The Ajarchs and Prophets. It says that God called the angels together, and in that meeting, God exalted the Son and told the angels what Christ's position was. Not that it has changed, not that it was any different than before this, but they needed to be reminded that He was the Son of God. So what that tells me is that Jesus and the angels were so close that they failed to comprehend his exalted position. Familiarity reads what? Now, in a perfect environment, it shouldn't do that. But once Satan started to insinuate that God wasn't fair, that God was unjust, that God was cruel. Then they started to look at Jesus in a whole different light. Because when the Father said, this is the Son, you will bow down to Him and you will give Him the allegiance He is due. Satan made a decision in his, Lucifer made a decision in his heart and said, I will never bow down to Christ ever again. And he 
he set his path and he set his course and he committed the first unpardonable sin. Now prior to that time, God tried to reason with him. Jesus tried to reason with him. Angels tried to reason with him.